without any further ado, welcome to Tim Dunton again. Thanks for being here, Tim. Hello. hello. Morning. Wow, you're a bunch of survivors. Everybody's here. It's pretty cool. Yeah, and usually by Friday or Thursday, it's starting to look a little thin on the ground. Anyway, um, so clearly a very long, well-planned out presentation. It's like sitting there having a beer. Hey, we've got somebody drop out. Okay, I'll do something. So I kind of threw together or merged a couple of little presentations I've done in the past. Um, and again, if you remember from uh, earlier in the week, our company, Reliability Solutions, we're, we're all about this thing called reliable manufacturing. Anybody remember what reliable manufacturing was, what we defined it as? On time, yeah. At the manufacturing level, it's the absolute confidence that you will, your process will start when you want it to start, produces the quality product I want it to produce for as long as I want it to do it. And it works at many levels. That definition works at, obviously at the asset level as well. Okay, the question is how do you get there? How do we get that? It's what we're all looking for, isn't it? So how do you do reliability? What kind of reliability initiatives do you have in going on in your plant right now? Who can name one? 5S. 5S, there you go. What else are we doing in the name of reliability? FMEAs. I love the acronyms. Anybody got a vibration program? Yeah? Anybody doing ultrasound, perhaps? Hello, right? What else? PDMA? Oil analysis? Operator maintenance, operator basic care, precision maintenance, a precision alignment. The list is pretty huge, isn't it? Thermal imaging. There's a ton of stuff that we do. And in many cases, the mistake we make is we try to do this piecemeal. Somebody comes along with the latest and greatest widget, we think, oh, that's cool, I need to get me some of that. And we grab it and we run with it. And often we'll see a bit of an improvement because of it, because that's why you bought it in the first place. But then the next new thing comes along and we forget about the old thing, right? We never really put a strong, cohesive, systematic strategy together to do all of this stuff, because this list, guys, is pretty big. You can, this is just a partial list of what needs to be done. You can't do it all at the same time. And so one of the mistakes we see a lot of folks doing is they're taking individual pieces of this, getting a little bit of a benefit from it, and then they'll slide back and then they'll go and do something else. Instead of trying to integrate it all together. What this does is it creates the illusion of improvement. We do something. Oh, we're going to do some training. That's what we need, training. So you do some training, you put all your mechanics through a precision alignment class or something like that, and coming out of that, you get a little bit of an uptick in performance. But if you don't set that up to be sustainable, what happens weeks to months to years later? What happens to the behaviors of those technicians that went through that alignment class? They were all using torque wrenches right out of the class, but if we don't sustain that, Six weeks from now, they're back to the same old, same old. So you slide back. So then you think, well, what we need is a procedure. So you go out and you spend a bunch of money having somebody write you a bunch of procedures on how to do this, that, and the other. And we implement those, and you get an uptick. And then eventually, everybody gets bored with the procedures. And so we slide back again. But all you're seeing mentally is the improvement piece. But it's an illusion, because you're really not getting anywhere. If you want true improvement. You've got to have systems and processes in place to standardize. We've got to standardize the knowledge. If we've discovered, and most of you are perhaps from companies that have many different facilities throughout the world, just about every kind of reliability problem that could ever be encountered, someone in some of your facilities has found and come across it. There's nothing that new in terms of failure anymore. And there's also a pretty good chance that somewhere in one of those facilities, somebody's figured out a way to prevent the problem. If we don't find, put systems in place to standardize that knowledge, find out, determine what best practices are, and make that, hey, this is the way we do this. 
not just from the maintenance side, from the operation side. When you get process interruptions and process upsets in your process, when do those typically occur? When does the process go really unstable for a little bit? Not at startup. Well, sometimes at startup. What happens at least twice a day? Shift change. Because operator B says, operator A is a dumbass. He doesn't know how to operate this thing. This is how we roll. And the plant's doing this, and you're making lousy product and not much of it, and then it all settles down and it runs that good. And 12 hours later, operator A comes back and says, he's an idiot. This is how we got to run this. If we don't standardize and say, hey, guys, this is the way. Now, I can't come in and do that. You can't pay some high-powered consultant to come in and do that. As a manager, you can't even do that. What you need to do is put those guys in a padded room with boxing gloves and say, come up with an answer, one answer that everybody can live with. You've got to have systems in place. You've got to be able to develop the teams and, of course, continuous improvement. The Senator was talking about that on Tuesday. So we look at this as a little bit like building a house. If you're going to go out and build a house, a house of reliability, what's the first thing you need? You've got to have a blueprint, right? Before you get the foundation, I need a blueprint. I need to know what this thing looks like so I can build my foundation. In our world, the blueprint is a thing we call ASD, Asset Strategy Development, which is a systematic, scientific way of looking at what must be done to maintain the function of the asset. Any of you who have been involved in RCM will probably recognize that thinking and language because it is based upon the thinking and the teachings of John Mowbray. Whereas RCM is a very intense, rigorous process, very good and should be applied in certain situations, a lot of people find it too intense and too rigorous to be done for the balance of plant. So ASD is designed for the rest of the stuff. The good thing about ASD is it asks the same questions. It's actually the seven questions plus one that we add. It uses the same thinking, which is the right thing. It's the right thing to do. But it does it in a way that you can do things like cut and paste. For example, if I, if I do a, develop a strategy for a Gould's 3196, under RCM, if I've got another Gould's 3196, I have to start at ground zero and start over, the purest RCM perspective because you're trying to identify every last little failure mode. With ASD, we figure if we can get 80% of them, we're good. And the rest you're going to pick up and modify through RCA activities later on anyway. So that means that I can take my 3196 and the strategies I'm going to use to maintain its function, and I can copy it over here to this one. Now, at this point, I have to look at the operating context of the new situation and make sure there's no additional failure modes because it's pumping acid or something like that that I have to consider. Or there may be failure modes that I don't have to consider, but the bulk of the work is done. What this means, it's something you can do, you can implement, you can apply. The reason we need to do ASD is because in today's environment, a lot of our decisions on strategies and how we look after equipment are purely based on emotion. Anybody been in the morning meeting? It's been a failure overnight. Plant manager's banging his fist on the table saying, I want something done. Okay, we'll PM it. We'll put a PM in place to manage this once in a lifetime failure. Meteorite hits the, the building. Yes, we're going to build a meteorite shelter now. Right? No science, just pure emotion. Or the operations guys say, I'm tired of walking by that thing that's breaking. You've got to do something about it. How many times have your vibe guys been tapped on the shoulder by an operator and say, hey, this thing, come over here, look at this, it's shaking. It's not on a route, it's, never, it's always been ignored, it's not a really particularly important asset, but because it's shaking, they go and put it on a route. And now all, so all of a sudden, your vibration analyst, who was looking after two or three hundred machines, is now probably looking at a few thousand because of system creep. So ASD is a, a de-emotionalizing systematic way of developing your strategies. Got to have it. After that, we need a foundation. Of course, the foundation for our house of reliability is going to be a work system. Effective work, essential work systems, planning and scheduling. 
If you do not have a way of executing the work in an efficient way, then it doesn't matter what you do in terms of building strategies, you can't implement them anyway. Of course, if we want to manage something, we have to measure it. And so the framework for our house, the framing, is, of course, management systems and metrics. We have to have meaningful. And I want to talk a little bit more at length about metrics um, in the latter half of this, uh, the third half of the presentation. Um, because one of the things I see out there is there's a ton of metrics, right? How many, how many people here are monitoring metrics? How many metrics are you monitoring? How big is that bucket? And half of them you look at and say, what the heck's this all about? Why am I looking at this once a week? Right? So trying to work our way through the minefield of metrics is important. In our world, we call these things essentials. A lot of people use the term basic. I don't believe basic is the right description. They're essential. And if you're going to start a reliability journey, these are the things, these are the elements that will give you a relatively quick return on the investment. We're talking about craft skills. Teaching craftsmen to put the machine together right. So instead of being able to identify the failures, you prevent the failures from happening in the first place. Same thing goes on the operations, the E&I guys. Vibration is probably, the, for most facilities, vibration is the cornerstone of condition monitoring. It's usually the first thing we go for. It has the broadest application on rotating equipment. Smaller facilities, obviously, ultrasound would be appropriate. Lubrication. And getting some kind of preventive maintenance system based on your ASD put into place. These are foundational. This is the first layer of bricks. A lot of times what people do is they immediately leap for technology. We put technology second. I know I'm in an ultrasound conference and I shouldn't say that, but we do. Because we think we need to give the people the skills and the knowledge before we give them the technology. Let the people then leverage the technology. We see a lot of places where people have become slaves to the technology. We do the technology thing first without getting our people involved, and now we're just charts for Charles. We're just looking at technology. Of course, the, the, the skills building, the, the people skill building never ends. That's as you increase their skill level, you increase their training. Another thing which may seem upside down to a lot of people, it's weird, management systems. Why wouldn't you do management? You've got to have systems in place first, right? Yes and no. The problem with management systems is that until you start trying to do the work and understand where you need help managing with a system, you can't really define what that system needs to look like. Yeah, you can have SAP Maximo guys come in and say, this is what you need, but they're not the guys who are going to be using it. So we, again, it's one of those situations where we become slaves to the system. CMMS programs, I, it's my pet peeve. Love them to death, by the way. You, it's, it's a necessary thing. But before we had a CMMS, how did we manage our work? Anybody remember the index cards? Did it work? Could you manage it? It worked great for us. Obviously, there's a, an administrative part to that that's, that's kind of wasteful, and that's where, of course, the computers are wonderful. But get the thing working on a card index system first. Understand what you need, and then have your CMMS designed to suit your needs. SAP is a wonderful program, but it's basically an accounting. That's where its origins. Hassel Plattner started making accounting software. And they've adapted it and say, hey, you can do this in maintenance. Well, yeah, but the, the bits that will be really useful for us in the maintenance world are kind of weak, in my opinion. Right? It, it does a lot of tracking and metrics, but what about the history? Where does that go? How do, where, where's the ease of getting machine history in there? Maintenance records, you know, the old filing cabinets we used to have. Because that history is a gold mine. That's where all of your information about your failures comes from. That's the first place to go look. Then on the top level, we've got the sort of higher level items. And notice I've got RCFA as a high level, top level. Wait a minute, Tim, why don't we start doing RCFAs immediately? Well, here's why. What we find is if people focus and drive their reliability journeys from RCAs, then the only time you act or do anything 
is when what has happened? A failure has happened. You are creating for yourself a failure-based system. You have to have a failure before anything happens. Our philosophy is a little bit different. I want to go out and get these failures before they have time to happen. FMEA could be down there, but that, but again, ASD is, is basically FMEA, right? So ASD is, a big chunk of an ASD is FMEA. It's building the strategy around studying the machine and understanding what the failures might be and the probabilities and everything else, rather than waiting for a failure to occur and then reacting to it. Of course, at that point, once you've got all this in place and you're on your journey, then you can Look at your staffing levels and whatever. What a lot of people do is they come in and blanket, here's 30% of your staff gone. They set you up, you know, when, when these companies come in and take over, they set you up for the reliable state. Yeah, I can run a plant that's reliable with X number of bodies. However, in order to get there, I need a lot more bodies. You've probably all seen this before, you know, run to failure, preventive, predictive, precision. Old, old chart, been around forever. A lot of people talk about, you know, preventive and predictive, it's a good thing to do, but remember, these are all failure-based. Even predictive, using uh, ultrasound or vibration. What do I do in vibration if the trend is flat and below alarm level? Nothing. I wait for the failure, right? Precision, as we call it precision, I know it's an overutilized word now, but uh, it's basically finding the problems before they actually come back and bite you. It's simple. I mean, when you mention the P word as well, people eyes, eyes glaze over and they think, oh, expensive, precision, right? Rolls Royce, very, very expensive. That's not the case. Simple things, lining up the keys properly, 180 apart. How much extra does it cost to put the coupling together like that versus like that? Doesn't. Which machine runs better, lasts longer? Right? So there's lots of arguments you can make for that. So just a little bit more detail. Again, ASD is designed to de-emotionalize the reliability decisions that are made. You have to remove emotion. You get in those meetings, guys start banging on the table, I want something done about this, that, and the other. Wait a minute. We need to take the emotion out of that situation. Okay? Again, ASD is based on the principles and thinking of RCM. It's just a little bit easier to implement. We also have a process called reverse ASD, which is really cool. It's basically a normal ASD, but you do it backwards. In other words, you start off, you use it to review an existing strategy. Most of your manufacturers will give you a, like a PM schedule, right? You open the book, page one, routine maintenance, blah, 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 blah. And that's usually cut and pasted into the work management system, and that's what we use, right? Well, this allows you to go back and look at that. And basically what you do is you look at each task and say, okay, this task here, check the oil level, whatever that is, and the, and, and the frequency, and you try to find out how many failure modes that will prevent, manage. And you'd be amazed when you start doing this at how much duplication of effort we have. We've had a couple of clients go through this on a well-established PM program and literally pulled hundreds of hours of work out of the system that they could retask to other things because they had a situation where an operator goes and checks the oil level once a, once a shift, PM mechanic does it once a day, the oiler comes around once a week, and then the vibe guy. Four people looking for the same failure modes. Why have we got four different individuals taking time out of their very busy days to look for the same thing? If one can't do it, then find somebody else who can do it, right? If you go back and have a long, hard look at your current strategies, duplication of work, there's money there. I had one particular client pulled close to 160,000 man hours out of their PM program. Yeah, many, many man hours of work. The questions you have to answer to do an ASD, 
What does it do? What's the function of the asset? Why is it there? How does it fail? Why does it fail? Are those what happens when it fails? In other words, do we care? You've got a lot of assets out there where, to be honest, we're doing all kinds of PMs and vibration work, and, and the stuff doesn't matter. It doesn't affect production. If it doesn't cause a safety hazard, and if it doesn't cost an arm and a leg to fix it, a big argument I say is, why not just let it run to failure? That's the cheapest and most cost-effective way of looking after that particular asset. That's okay. You know, if, if, if that is nothing, then end of story. ASD's done. The big thing we have to determine is the failure or the individual failure mode. Is it age-related or random? If it's age-related, then some kind of time-based, scheduled replacement repair, res restoration is required. If it's random, then the only thing you can do is condition monitoring. And if it's random, where the P to F curve is so short, like instantaneous light bulb type short, then you're looking at a system redesign, or you run it to failure. So what do we have to do to manage the failure? What's the task? What's the inspection? Is it ultrasound? Is it oil? Is it vibration? Remember on machines, too, there's always a combination of age and random. A, a centrifugal pump is a classic example. Back pull-out pump. Why is a back pull-out pump designed to pull out the back? You know what I mean? You've got a centrifugal pump. You take the whole power head, impeller, the rotating assembly out, leave the casing in the line. Why is it designed that way? Sorry? On the wearings, yes. The seal is a, is a random-natured failure. See, the problem is in that pump, I've got random failures, the mechanical seal, the bearings. I also have an impeller failure mode, or one of the failure modes on an impeller is going to be age-related, isn't it? Uh, over time, pumping an abrasive product, that impeller is going to wear out. And if the first impeller lasts two years and you haven't changed your process any, how long is the second impeller probably going to last? It's a pretty good age-related failure. So our clever pump designers designed our pump to allow us to pull the whole power head out without disturbing bearings and seals, replace the impeller, age-related failure on a scheduled basis, spin a new impeller on there, put the whole thing back together, and Cadillac along. How many of you all actually do that? One or two. What happens most of the time? That power head comes out of that bowl, you rebuild the whole thing, right? And so what are you doing with those bearings which are patent F failures? You are resetting them back and you're actually becoming less reliable. Same with a mechanical seal, right? So machines are going to have age and random. We need to understand what, what they are. So what are the tasks we need to do? Seven is how often should we do it? Frequency, of course, if it's a, an age-related thing, replace it T. If it's a uh, random thing, we figure out what P to F is, and then P to F by 2 is how frequently we should do the inspection. The last question that we ask that's not asked as part of the formal RCM is who? Who should do the task? So who should do these tasks? How do you make that decision? Depends on what? How easy they are to detect. It depends on the nature of the task, doesn't it? But your guiding principle is here. Is it, within your organizations, both on the operations and maintenance side, you have certain people that are, when you look at their labor rates, are, are less expensive than others, right? You know, if you ta start talking about vibration techs and things like that, by the time you've invested in all their tools and instruments and all their training, you've got a fair amount of dollars invested in those folks. Perhaps not so much for an operator, perhaps. The rule of thumb here is you want to use the least expensive person who can still satisfactorily perform the task. That's the goal. That makes it completely optimized. It Say what? I can hear music. 
not even good music. Have you put the music on, Mark? Tell me you haven't gone back to that elevator music again. That's all right. Anyway, I can probably project far enough. You want to use the person who's the least expensive that can still satisfactorily perform the task. We see a lot of places where we've got vibe guys wandering around doing visual, audible, and tactile inspections on machines. In the name of PM, why? You've trained them with all this technology and tools. Why not have them use the tools in the right place? Yet they still don't have enough time to complete their regular routes. Again, in planning and scheduling, we need a system to execute the work that is going to be generated. If you don't have that, then you're going to be really struggling. Anybody seen this or done this? When we do our planning and scheduling classes, this is an example we do. Anybody done the Lego house? How long did it take you to build it the first time? Typically, we average guys, here's a, here's a bag of Lego, all the parts. We give them a picture, we give them a built house at the front of the room and say, okay, go build it in groups of three or four. And typically, that will take them about 45 minutes to an hour first time through. Then we go through all the planning and scheduling and talk about how you do it and lay it out and they get a chance to plan it. How long do you think it takes to really build a Lego house? Our record, my record, so far I've had one group and they were all very young engineers with very dexterous fingers. There was four of them and it took them 97 seconds. 97 seconds to build that. From the ground up, no pre-assembly. They staged it out. Interestingly enough, they had three people working and one person was QA all the way through. Kind of interesting to watch them do it. We teach a lot of our leadership classes now. You know, we're using iPads a lot more in the classroom. And now what we're seeing with this is these guys will actually pre-stage it and photograph it. So they'll actually have a little iPad presentation showing what to do next, sort of on-the-job training as they're building these things. It's amazing to watch. I'm going to talk about metrics in a little bit, um, but, but one, a basic human need, a basic human requirement is for us to be able to see progress. If we're changing our behavior, if you're trying to change behavior, then we have to be able to see progress. It's a human need to do that. If we can't see what the progress is, then we give up. Okay, now that's psychology and I'm not going to go deep into that, but, but basically it's a need. Metrics are our form of doing that. With them, what's in it for me? If you want me to do something that I may not want to do, the only way you can get me to do it is to show what's in it for me, right? And we don't do a very good job of that, certainly at the craft level. Because don't forget, what's in it for me for the manager, the plant manager, is probably completely different to what's in it for me for the craftsman, right? Very different. So how do you measure reliable manufacturing progress? How are you measuring it right now? We'll get into that in a little bit. There's lots of different things. The mistake with these metrics is though we have this big bucket of metrics. And there are certain metrics that are what we call strategic in nature, big picture stuff. Overall reliability numbers, right? Maintenance costs, global numbers like that. The problem is me down here cranking away on my torque wrench. It's really hard for me to understand that when I tighten that nut to the correct torque value, I have made the slightest bit of difference to the global reliability. In my heart, I kind of know it's the right thing to do, but there's no measure of how effective I've just been. So I, as a worker bee, I'm completely disconnected from the strategic. So what we have to do is connect those dots. We have to create a suite of metrics that apply to the, not just the strategic level, but under there, there are some tactics that you will apply to achieve the, the strategy. And then we have to have application metrics that support the tactics. And if you don't lay that out ahead of time and you don't sort of build that with some logic, you end up with just looking at a whole bunch of metrics. You know, one of the things that we used to look a lot was uh, overall vibration, plant-wide. People say, what on earth do you look at, that, look at that for? It doesn't mean anything. At the application and tactical level, it doesn't. But at the strategic level, it's a very, very good indicator of plant condition. 
Again, we've talked about this, our essentials, our craft skills, operators, uh, inspection rounds, condition monitoring. These are all essential elements. These will give you return on investment very rapidly. Remember, t with technology, we need to leverage the essential skills of the people. Don't let the people leverage the technology or the technology rule the people. Same with management systems. If we do management systems too early on, we become slaves to the system. I can manage activities on paper if I have to. Something else, you know, a lot of folks have, uh, have started using for their operator rounds, these electronic PDA handhelds, and there's a whole slew of these wonderful tools, by the way, great tools. One of the things when people start to roll those out, you've got a bunch of gnarly old mechanics, or gnarly old operators who are technology phobic anyway, and now you're having them to get out of the control room and actually go do work, so they're pissed off about that. And now you're throwing this technology at them, and that technology's got ways of tracking where they're at. They are very, very unhappy campers. Every time I've seen someone try to implement and roll it out like that, it's, it's fallen backwards. So I, what we recommend is get your rounds going on paper. Because what happens then is once people are comfortable with the rounds, they see it, they see the value, there's measurements to show the value, they see what's in it for them. What then happens is the rounds become a bit of an administrative problem. Because I've got to write all these numbers down, and then all of a sudden you create a pull system. Can I have one of those computers, please, an iPad, to do this instead of having to write it on paper? And all of a sudden the, the, the transition is much smoother. Okay? So don't let the systems drive you. You drive the systems. Okay? Again, from the improvement perspective, RCFAs. And that's, that's why we like to use RCAs and our root cause failure analysis as part of the big strategy. Because ASD is not 100%. There are going to be things that you will miss. There are failure modes that you will miss, and that's okay, because when the failure does occur, then you use RCA to review the strategy. The ASD document, the, the, the strategy document for any asset or system is a living document, right? It's a living document. Any questions so far? Make sense? This is a hideous chart, and I hate it, but just do all that and know all that, you're good. <laughs> um, again, this is our sort of knowledge matrix, and, and the whole idea of this is you can't really see it, but up on the left here we have the various functions, uh, organizational functions from maintenance manager to plant manager down through the crafts, engineering, and what have you. Across here are the knowledges and skills. Red means there needs to be an awareness, yellow means there needs to be an understanding, and green needs, means you need competency. So for example, for a reliability engineer, for example, he needs to be competent in all of these items. Notice there are very few, there's a few white spots, but there's very few blank spots. Everybody needs an awareness. You know, that's one of the themes I've heard from many of our presentations this week, is it takes everybody, right? You can't do it on your own. The plant manager needs to be aware of reliability, needs to have understanding in certain areas, needs awareness in others, and of course needs competency. <laughs> Interesting, senior management doesn't actually require a whole lot of competency anywhere, actually. I, I, just, I just noticed that. <laughs> yeah, okay, moving right along. Um, so let's talk a little bit now about these, these metrics I was talking about. Um, and again, I want to try to explain this thinking, this strategic, tactical, and application thinking. Okay? It all starts with a business objective, compelling story. If you're going to implement change and you're going to do reliable manufacturing, what is your intent? How do you communicate strategic intent today? How does your company communicate its strategic intent to you? Mission statement, vision statement, right? How many people know what their vision statement is? Well, that's pretty compelling then, isn't it? Three. <laughs> Why? Because when you look at these, oh, we want to be the best we can be, right? How many of those are there out there, right? One of the problems with these is they're all very nice, cuddly, warm, fuzzy things, but they don't really tell you very much. If you can't tie what you're doing today, sitting in your office, directly to that vision statement, there's a problem. You should be able to look at what you're doing today, look at the vision statement, and directly link those. If you don't do that, then what's the point? 
Here's an example. Continuous improve the operations and maintenance of our plant assets to become the best XX company in the world. Employ various methodologies and processes so that productivity and uptime is maximized. Costs are minimized while producing consistent quality production and therefore increasing profitability. Kind of long, wordy. Absolutely. <laughs> but, but look at what it tells us. It says, we want to improve the operations, continuous improvement, operations and maintenance. This isn't a maintenance function. This isn't an operations function. It's both. Oh, and by the way, you are going to use methodologies. You're going to be systematic. You're not just going to randomly go out and do it. We're looking at uh, improving productivity and uptime. Costs are minimized and consistent quality. So if I come to work one morning and I'm not working on one of those four or five items, what am I working on? The wrong things. So this organization gets together and they say, well, based on that, what do we need to be good at? We need to be good at these things. And you sit down and discuss it. Leadership sits down and says, okay, we felt, and these particular guys said, if we become the best in the world at reliability, quality, productivity, and organizational effectiveness, then we'll be good. So they break that compelling business statement down into the elements. The next thing they do is they say, okay, little working group here, reliability. Come back and tell us what good reliability looks like. What do we need to do? And we'll just take that little piece as an example. If you're going to be good at reliability, what do you have to be good at? Moving right along. <laughs> you better be good at predictive maintenance, right? You better be good at preventive maintenance. You better be good at breakdown maintenance, to be honest, because that is a strategy. You better be able to do precision maintenance and you better design it in. And they broke it down into those elements. So they take the reliability piece and they put these subject matter teams together and said, okay, this is what good reliability looks like. This is the strategic level. These are the tactics. The tactics we are going to apply to get good at reliability are becoming good at corrective, preventive, precision, design. Those are our tactics. Then you take each of those individually and what are the ta what's the applications I need to do to become the best at corrective maintenance? And again, we're, we're thinking run to failure, breakdown type situations. How do I get good at that? I better have a good list of spare parts on hand, right? So I better have good work uh, spare parts. Where are we at? Spares inventory. I better have some standard job plans. My planning and scheduling better be good. I better have the procedures written for doing certain tasks. And I better make sure my base skill sets of my craftspeople are good. That way I'll be the best at corrective work. Okay? So at the application level, we have those elements. Now, each of those elements you see here, reliability, corrective, preventive, can we make metrics up that monitor those? Absolutely. There are metrics for all of those. The problem is that everybody looks at them all the time. When I'm doing my day-to-day -day work, where do I need to be working on, metrics-wise? This area here, because I know this supports the tactics, which in turn support the strategic. The tactical and strategic metrics, they're sort of long-term, quarterly annually, six months, maybe monthly in some cases. If you're trying to manage your reliability initiative looking at overall equipment effectiveness every day, you're going to be in a world of pain because you're going to be dragged right, left, and center. Leading indicators, lagging indicators, right? So we need strategic goals and measures of success. We need the supporting tactical metrics, and then we need the key performance application, the KPIs, the day-to-day -day stuff. They all need to be explained and tied together. Right now, what I see out there is this big melting pot bucket full of all kinds of stuff. 
And you, you walk into facilities and there's a whole wall of charts, you know. None of them are moving because they're looking at strategic indicators which by definition are very slow moving. The other thing to remember is that one person's tactical work is another person's strategic work. For example, the plant manager's application day to day probably sets the strategy for those that are working below. Right? A supervisor's application work is probably tactical or strategic work for the craftsperson. But it's not a, a line, it's, it's sort of a sliding scale. So let's talk a little bit about metrics here, just uh, a few minutes. The first thing you have to ask yourself with metrics is what are you trying to do? I know there's a, there's a suite of metrics out there, there's all kinds of different ones. You have to sit down within your organization, within your operating context and say, okay, what do we want to do here? What am I trying to achieve? What are the behaviors I wish to control? And then select a metric that allows you to manage that. Don't pick it out of a book just because they said it was good. You need to look at your own environment and come up with those metrics. By all means, look at them and select from that list. But you need to pick it. You can't have guys like us or any other consultant come in and say, this is what you've got to look at. Because we don't know your organization. You've got to determine what needs to be improved. Then you've got to look at current state. And that can be painful. That can be very painful because you're going to go in and start finding out where we are. And you're going to be, if you're not careful, treading on toes. Another one is determine how much progress is possible. I'm all for setting goals and stretch goals, but if as a human being I can't see the light at the end of the tunnel as something other than the train coming in my direction, I give up very quickly. So you have to look at where you are, right? I do a lot of work in many, many different industries. And, you know, you start talking about precision maintenance, you go to the mines and places like that. You know, you're talking, well, let's mic to a tenth of a thou. You're dreaming. Just get them to use something other than a tape measure to measure bearing fits. You're doing well, right? So you've got to f adjust to what you think they can accomplish, right? Keep it simple. You need to put a plan together. How are we going to apply it? See, a lot of people just throw the metric out there and expect it to happen. We need plans. What's the steps? This particular organization looked at this. This is just for precision maintenance, maintenance effectiveness. They said that what we want to do, we will be more effective if we implement condition monitoring, vibration, and PDMA on 100% of all motors. They said we want to complete two precision attempts a month. We want X machines in a precise state per quarter, achieve X savings of um, energy costs, and track the top $10 per horsepower machines. Those were our goals, strategic or tactical, actually. Okay. They also made this statement. Maintenance will be viewed as more effective to plant reliability and profitability when the unscheduled unscheduled board mill downtime is at or less than 4% of scheduled. Now again, don't worry about the numbers, it's not important. But what they can do, if I know that I'm 4% of scheduled, my current production is 72.6%, my 2008 goal is 76%, outage time's been removed, I, from that I can basically calculate that's how much time I need to be up, basically that times 0.4 is 256 hours a year. So I'm allowed under those rules, 256 hours of downtime, or roughly five hours a week. Now, can I track that as an application metric every week? Hey, guys, we're less than five hours. We did good. Oh, we got worse than five hours. We're bad. So from my strategic metric, I've driven it down to produce an application day to day. They don't look at this number until the end of the year. What they're working on is the stuff that can really make a difference. Because when I do this to a machine here, can I find out if I infected our downtime this week? Can I parade all that out? Absolutely. So the global strategic metric was overall downtime or uptime, yet the day-to-day -day is application. Two different metrics, two different ways of looking at them. We like to use the whole uh, traffic light deal. And again, you sit down, the managers say, well, if we're doing four hours a week, we're sustaining. We're not getting better, but we're not getting worse. Less than three hours a week is good. We're improving. Greater than five hours, we're in bad shape. 
And basically, you can go through all of these metrics and do the same kind of idea. These guys were looking at overall vibration levels. Now, one way of applying a vibration level metric is that after a machine is repaired, part of what it takes to put it in a precise state is once repaired, in a reconditioned state, the overall vibration levels as a guide should be better than 0.07 inches per second peak. Okay? So what they do is they set that as a goal. And after the mechanics done the work, that's what we try to achieve. Okay? But at the same time, you can actually look at the overall plant-wide. And it was very interesting listening to the Senate to talk about safety and reliability. We've seen some very interesting trends from companies where reliability and safety very closely follow each other. And we've also seen so got some nice trends that reliability and overall plant-wide vibration number trends very, very closely together. So it's a good strategic indicator. But the thing is, to really affect the overall vibration level in your plant, you're going to have to put about a third of your machines into a precise state. So when you go out there and start aligning stuff, it's going to be a while before you see anything. So that overall, I don't care what the numbers are. What I care about is it going up or coming down. How much it's coming down, the slope doesn't matter. Just need to see it coming down. Area-wide, get a little bit more kick. And what we really like looking at is the top 40 or the top 10. So the average overall vibration of your top 10 worst machines, your vibe guys can give you that number. That's the one you want to see dropping quickly. Because which should you be working on first? The top 10, right? Your, your worst bad actors. So here's an example there, mill overall vibration index. It's flat, it's not going up, not going down, just a, maybe a slight slope. Here's the area, and then your top 40. The top 40 is the application metric, that's the one you're going to see the result in, but it supports the tactical and the strategic metric here. Different ways of looking at the same numbers. But we're looking at it strategically, tactically, and application. Here's a good leading indicator. You know, those are all lagging indicators. Let's talk about a leading indicator. And this looks at where the effort is going. When we go and try to put a machine into a precise state, you don't get success every single time. You have to decide what you want to try to achieve. This particular organization said, you know, I'd like to see at the end of the year a third of my machines in a precise state. So they broke that down from their current time, that nine months, and that means, okay, we're going to have to try X machines per month. And they looked at the number of mechanics they had, divided that, and said that means each guy is going to have to have at least two attempts per month. Can I measure whether I'm trying twice? Can I put a metric, a management metric on that, so the supervisors, planners, and these people are making sure the attempts get done? Absolutely. So their application metric became number of attempts. Now, typically, in the real world, if you're getting a two to one hit rate, in other words, you go out there, you make the attempt, and you get precise state half the time, you're doing pretty well. A lot of times there are many factors that prevent you achieving precision right away. You may get into pipe strain issues or base problems and things like that. So you, you make an improvement, but you don't get the final result. So you factor all that in and you can drive it. Okay, we need to make X attempts per month. That will give us a two to one hit. That means we'll achieve this. And by the end of the year, we'll have achieved our strategic goal of X machines in a precise state. Again, strategic, tactical application. Now, precision state isn't just 0.07 inches per second, by the way. That's 0.07 inches per second with a fully documented, properly conducted soft foot check, pipe strain checks, thermal growth accounted for, and all of the other stuff that goes into that. And in fact, what a lot of people struggle with initially on, on, on this type of work is the documentation. So they actually throw a metric in there saying number of attempts, number of successes, and number of successes with completed documentation. So they can manage the documentation side of it. Here's a good one. Outage improvement work. This is a really good leading indicator. How much of the work done in your outage 
is going to be devoted to precision. You need to go into the room when you're planning these and scheduling these or planning these outages and say, okay, how much time, how many man hours are you going to give me to devote just to precision work? You see, if you don't do that and you don't get a commitment from the various management involved, then it's very easy when something comes up right before the outage to have your guys pulled off all this precision work, improvement-based work, uh, to go fix the other stuff that broke. So you start managing. What percentage of time, Mr. Manager, would you be prepared to give me? Is it 5%? Is it 10 I don't know. Just give me a number. And we'll manage that. Because it's only when you start doing this type of work that you will start to see improvements in reliability. Everything else is failure-based. You're fixing stuff that broke. So again, scorecards and that kind of stuff we've talked about already. This particular organization basically said 10% was the magic number. 10%. They were prepared to say at least 10% of the man hours in any outage should be devoted to improvement work, just as a start. If they got 15%, they were improving. If they got less than 5%, they were failing. And then, of course, you can put all that in a, a monthly scorecard. Energy savings from um, improving the quality of the machines. There's a big power savings to be had by aligning machines properly. Belts are huge here, folks. There are untold amounts of money on the table by properly adjusting, installing, aligning, and tensioning belts. And it's actually quite easy to calculate what the losses are uh, just by calculating the slip. How do you calculate the slip on a belt drive? You know the RPM of the machine, right? You know the diameter of the pulleys. The theoretical RPM of the driven is just that multiplied by the ratio of the pulley diameter, right? So the slip is the theoretical RPM divided by actual. How many times do you shut fans down after you've started them 24 hours after to retention re the belt? As you're supposed to. Never happens, right? Once it's running, buddy, it's running. We ain't taking it down. Any idea what that might cost you? Because there's a direct relationship between slip and horsepower. And I know what horsepower costs. I've had some guys do some really, really good work on this. So now an operator, you know, it used to be at, when you go into a shutdown, mechanic go out and inspect the V-belts, right? Replace as required. I'm all about moving any inspections I can from the precious downtime to on the run. Well, you can take a strobe light out and you can look at the belts and see if they're cracked. Or you can get a quantitative number. So the inspection now becomes go out, measure the driver and driven, and calculate slip. And you get a list right before the outage. And you take the top 10 slippers that you've got, and you've got the horsepower it's costing you, the energy consumers, and you go and tighten and adjust those instead of randomly doing them all. That's why you start to accrue certain amounts of energy savings. The good thing about doing energy savings is it's all about dollars and cents. It's instant gratification, instant return on investment. Again, a couple of other little things here. You know, all the uh, number of motor repairs, these are what we call supporting measurements. The, the amount of motors we sent out, the rotating a pump mean time between failure, those are great supporting metrics. But you shouldn't be managing on those. That's the bonus, that's the gravy. You need to manage on the behaviors that we need to change. I've got a bunch of stuff in here real quick. It's just what we should be looking at, which of these metrics should be looked at quarterly, monthly, annually, and then I've got planning and all that kind of stuff, and I've been given a hook by my buddy up here, so. Um, questions? I know it's kind of quick. Normally that's half a day's worth, but hold on tight. Swallow hard. Any questions? Oh, I'm only 15 minutes late. Come on, man. Thank you all. Appreciate it.